Today is the last day of your training course. We'd like to once again express our joy that you have come for this purpose and we'd like to take the opportunity to to stress or repeat certain certain points. We'd like to express our delight that all of you who who came as tourists in the beginning will be returning as pilgrims with a full backpack of wealth to carry with you. Let us use the word God in speaking about this this wealth or this highest thing that each of us have something which is truly the highest. Buddhists have a God in a Buddhist way, or their Buddhists have their own God. Christians have their God, and scientists have the God of scientists. But even better than that is to end all problems and all questions about God so that we can be God for ourselves. A mistake that we have in this modern world is that people stick to religion or believe in religions according to the various authorities of each religion. And so this leads to argument, conflict, and competition among the religions. When the god of Buddhists can genuinely quench dukkha, when the god of Christians can truly quench dukkha, and when the god of scientists can actually quench dukkha, if it's the genuine God, if it's a true God, it will be able to quench dukkha. And then all problems regarding God will be finished, finally, once and for all. When we can truly quench dukkha, then we'll, we'll no longer wonder what religion should I follow or what is God really like, and all the arguments and disputes that go on amongst people who are still in doubt or confusion about religion and God. All this will end when we can actually quench dukkha. When we talk about seeing God or seeing the Buddha, or seeing Dhamma. The important thing isn't having seen this thing or that thing or whatever. The only thing that matters is seeing that we can quench dukkha. Seeing the, seeing our own quenching of dukkha. This is the only thing that is important. The Buddha once said regarding himself, it isn't, it, does, it isn't enough to see this body. It's not enough just to see this body walking back and forth across India. There were many people who saw the physical body of the Buddha and didn't get any benefit from that or just reading books about the Buddha's life, that still isn't really what matters. In India, in the Buddha's time, there were many people who weren't at all interested in the Buddha. There were many who didn't follow Buddhism. There were even some who who set themselves up as enemies of Buddhism 
and even a few who tried to harm, even kill the Buddha. For example, there were a number of women who were very angry at the Buddha. They called him, they called him the widow maker because their husbands had gone off and become monks and they were very angry about this. The Buddha, however, said that the one who sees how dukkha arises and how dukkha is quenched and then understanding thus is able to quench dukkha accordingly. This is the one who has seen the Buddha. You yourselves now have had an opportunity to study how it is that dukkha arises and you have been studying also anapanasati, a very skillful means for the quenching of dukkha. And so this means that to some extent you have seen the Buddha. And so seeing the Buddha means to see the actual quenching of dukkha. Seeing the Dhamma is to clearly see the true quenching of dukkha. And to see God in the, the correct meaning of this word God is to see the genuine quenching of dukkha. As we said the other day, you must have the following, you must have knowledge regarding how to quench dukkha. You must practice for the sake of quenching dukkha. And then you must receive the fruits of, of actually quenching that dukkha. These are the things that are necessary for us to have all three of these aspects so that dukkha is finished. So first of all, you must have a, a complete, a sufficiently complete and thorough understanding of Paticca Samuppada, about the conditioned arising of dukkha. And you must have a sufficiently complete understanding about how to practice according to the principle of Paticca Samuppada in order to quench dukkha. If you have these, this understanding, then you will have succeeded in coming here. Your time spent here will have fulfilled the purpose of your coming to Suan Mok, namely having knowing how to quench suffering. That you would have a complete understanding about the arising of dukkha and how to quench it from just a 10 day course like this is impossible. However, it's more than possible that you will have enough understanding about dependent origination and the way to quench dukkha that you can continue studying this and continue practicing according to this understanding until your understanding is complete enough for you to quench dukkha completely, finally. There's one extremely important fact to, to consider. The fact that this life is a problem. There are the things that cause these, these problems or are the basis for these problems. And these are the eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body and mind. 
And then there are the things which come in to stir up the problems, the sights, sounds, smells, tastes, touches, and thoughts. Now this is all completely natural. There's no way to avoid it. This is just the way it is for human beings in this world. So then, it's just a matter of dealing correctly with this reality. If one isn't able to deal correctly, then all kinds of problems are stirred up every time a sense object makes contact with sense organ. But if we can deal with this correctly, wisely, then dukkha will not arise and there won't be any more problems. This is a problem that exists both at home and outside the home. It exists in our families, in the workplace. It's a problem for ourselves, for our friends, for all the people we know. This is a problem that's everywhere. And so we ought to find out how to solve it. Next, we'd like to come to the fact about belief. Belief is a very basic thing in religion. In all religions there is some form of faith and way of believing. This is in all religions. Each religion will have its way of belief. In Buddhism, if one is going to study Buddhism, then one must believe one's own experience of the truth of things. Each thing has within it a truth of how that thing is, what that thing is. We must, our belief is in this experience of the truth of each thing that we come to realize. It might sound strange to you, but we say that when we learn about Buddhism, or we learn about Buddhism, but we don't have to believe the Buddha. That's the way the Buddha wanted it. He didn't want anyone to believe him as a teacher or anything like that. He didn't ask people to believe him. What he hoped was that people would believe the truth that they experienced themselves in each, in, in things that he was pointing to. To have that, that direct experience of things and believe in that truth. For example, the Buddha taught that tanha, desire, is the cause of dukkha. But he didn't want us to believe this just because he told us. Instead, he wanted us to look at this dukkha and to examine desire and see how it is that desire causes dukkha. We've got both of these things in our lives, both desire and suffering. And so the Buddha wanted us just to look at these and see the truth in them that he pointed to. The most important thing to, to remember is that for the, the whole process, the whole stream of dependent origination, 
how it is that consciousness arises, the way feeling arises, the way desire arises, the way attachment arises. The important thing, the necessary thing, is that we must see this in that thing itself. How each of these arises must be seen in the thing itself. Don't ever forget that the truth of something appears only in that thing and nowhere else. We can only see the truth of something in that thing. And so for this whole flow of dependent origination, we must see the truth of each one of these in each of them, in each of these links. This is what the Buddha taught. And he said, if all, you, all we do is go and believe him, then we're just as stupid as before. We haven't gotten any smarter. If you just go and believe somebody else when they tell you how sugar tastes, how, how sugar is sweet, and how salt is salty. If you just believe this, then you're as stupid as ever. And it's the same with all dhammas, all the truths, the natural truths the Buddha has pointed to, that we need to experience the truth of those things. And this is what we should believe in, only this, the truth of the things that we experience themselves and our own, and we should believe in our own experience of these things. Otherwise, it's just a blind faith in which we're as dumb as ever. We don't learn anything and we can't even, we have no increased ability to help ourselves. So one must study and practice according to the principle of the Galama Sutta. This was a discourse of the Buddha in which he told us that one should not believe something just because it is widely spread about or just because it's a common rumor or just because it's a tradition that's been passed along for many years, or just because it, it fits with logic, or just because it fits with philo philosophical speculations, or just because it agrees with one's own opinions. We shouldn't even believe something just because it's common sense. And surely we shouldn't believe something merely because the speaker is attractive, charismatic, or seems believable. And we even shouldn't believe something merely because the speaker is my teacher. Instead, we only believe the truth that we directly experience ourselves, the truth of that particular thing. This is all that we believe. We've got copies of this that maybe we can distribute later so that you can use this principle in your practice. In Buddhism, we don't want you to believe any authority other than the direct experience of the truth of things in those things. And so our belief in dukkha and in the cause of dukkha is based only in seeing the truth in dukkha, seeing the truth in desire that desire is the cause of dukkha. This is how we believe in Buddhism. The Buddha, to see for ourselves that suffering does not arise from past actions, whether in earlier in this life or in some 
so-called past lives, and that suffering does not arise because God created it or because it was determined by God. These were the words of the Buddha that suffering does not happen because of past actions or because of the will of God, but suffering only happens because we act incorrectly regarding eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, and mind. Many people who come here wonder why it is that we never talk about past lives or, you know, so-called reincarnations. The reason for this is because in Buddhism, there is no such thing as reincarnation. This is not taught or believed in Buddhism. Because in Buddhism there is no self to go and get incarnated or reincarnated. So there's absolutely no basis in Buddhism for a, be a belief in reincarnation. And so, this, these so-called past actions or old karma has absolutely no connection to suffering here and now. There's, there's no relationship whatsoever. And reincarnation just has nothing to do with Buddhism. Nonetheless, there are many Buddhists who believe in reincarnation. Even in Thailand, there are many people who cling to this belief. In India, in the Buddha's time, it was just the same way. There were many people who believed in reincarnation. And when the Buddha spoke to these people, he told them, the eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, and mind. This is old karma. Karma, by the way, just means action, although it's explained in many confused ways these days, but it just means action. Old karma means old actions, past actions. The Buddha said that this old karma is merely eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, and mind. But those people were probably too stupid to understand. And maybe you yourselves are having trouble understanding how it is that the eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, and mind are old karma. This is all the Buddha said. This is the only old karma the Buddha talked about. The tipitika, the three baskets which have preserved the, the Buddha's teaching, are full of things like this which Buddhists still don't understand. But over and over again, when somebody would talk to the Buddha and when they wanted to, when they wanted old actions, they wanted to talk about or believe in old deeds and the, how this old karma affects this life. The Buddha said, here, eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, and mind. That's, that's your past karma. This belief in old karma was one that came from other belief systems that had existed in India for many years before the Buddha's time. And it wasn't the Buddha's intention for us to go and believe in such things. The Buddha stressed repeatedly that happiness and suffering do not arise from old karma, from old actions that happiness and suffering arise just because of the eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, and mind. Or he would say that the eyes, ears, toes, the eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, and mind, those 
are the old karma. But people didn't listen or they didn't want to understand or, or they were just not intelligent enough to catch the meaning. If we act foolishly, incorrectly, towards Paticca Samupada at the eyes, ears, to- nose, tongue, body, and mind, then there is hell instantaneously. But if one acts correctly regarding dependent origination at re- toward or at the eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, and mind, then there is heaven instantaneously. Heaven and hell have nothing to do with past actions unless or unless we say that it's just the eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, and mind which are the old karma. And we also want you to know that when we say things like this to you, when we try to point out these facts that we will be severely criticized in very unpleasant, crude, and nasty language, um, defamed, insulted by, not just criticized, but they'll very angrily drag Ajahn Buddhadasa's name through the mud of their own minds with by the conservative and orthodox Buddhists both in Bangkok and in places like Sri Lanka. Now the next point, the one that happiness and suffering have nothing to do with 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 God creating or willing it. In India, in the Buddhist time, They didn't have the word God because God is an English word. But the word they were using then was Isawara, which is the Sanskrit form, or Itsara is the Pali form. And the Buddha said, Itsara nam mahetu. Na Isawara nimmana. Which means God is not the cause of happiness, sukha, and suffering, dukkha. That these things, happiness and suffering, occur depending only on whether we practice correctly or incorrectly regarding the law of e tapajayata when there's the eyes ears nose tongue body and mind if we respond wisely in line with the law of e tapajayata then there will be happiness sukha but if we act incorrectly foolishly blindly according to this law of Itapajayata, then there will be suffering. This is, it's, that's all there is. It has nothing to do with some God willing or creating or determining these things. And so if we act correctly with, at, with regarding the eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, and mind, correctly according to the law of Itapajayada, then even a herd of gods could not make you suffer. And even and if we acted incorrectly according to the law of Itapajayada, even a herd of gods could not help you. But I've told you already that there is in fact in Buddhism a god. Buddhism has a god. However, the Buddhist god is not a personal god. The Buddhist god is an impersonal god. <clears throat> that is the 
the highest truth or law regarding the arising and quenching of dukkha. This impersonal God is the God of Buddhism. Please, please remember this. And so please don't believe all those books written by Western scholars that say that Buddhism is atheist. This just isn't true. Buddhism is theistic. However, this God is an impersonal one. And so don't, don't waste your time believing what these guys write in their books because they, they don't understand Buddhism. Remember that always we believe, well, when, when the Buddha teaches something, we listen. Then we take it and consider it. We examine it carefully until we see the truth of that thing. For example, when they say that God wants us to love our neighbors. On this one, we don't have to go and believe God or believe it just because God is supposed to have said it. But we can examine the, the facts and we can see what happens when we love our neighbors. Instead of just believing this blindly, we can consider it and put it into practice and then see for ourselves what it is to love our neighbors <clears throat> and what results come from loving our neighbors. Then we only need believe what comes from our own experience. It's irrelevant really whether God or whoever said it. We need to see and believe through our own direct experience of the truth of each thing. If one goes and believes the Buddha or God immediately, then that is blind faith, which is incorrect faith, foolish faith. But if one only believes after having examined this, the truth of that thing, and seeing the truth in it, then that is correct faith. And this is the sole intention and purpose of the Buddha. Not that we believe in him, but that we believe in our own experience. For example, when the Buddha says something like, to do good is good, and to do evil is evil. We don't have to believe the Buddha, we can just look and see for ourselves that this is in fact true. This is the purpose of the Buddha, that we believe in our own experience. If someone comes and tells us that salt is salty and we go and believe them, then we're stupid. If we go and believe that salt is salty, just because they told us, then we don't know anything. And we're probably worse off because we're blind in this belief. But if we go and taste the sugar for our, or the salt for ourselves, then we know, oh, this is what saltiness is like. We know this clearly and directly. And then this belief is not stupid. So all the dhammas of Buddhism, all the teachings of Buddhism have this characteristic that the truth of each dhamma appears right there in that dhamma and nowhere else. It doesn't appear in the speaker's mouth or in the book. And so to blindly believe what is told to us or what we read is stupidity. We need to taste the truth of that for ourselves and believe only our own taste, direct and personal taste of it. When I say to you that to believe 
what the Buddha says or what God says without examining it for yourself is merely blind faith. When I say this, I'm going to be insulted and disparaged and, and insulted by both Buddhists and Christians. But I'm, I put up with this abuse in order to help you have a correct understanding of things. I think you, you ought to know this to understand the situation in this world. So the truth of everything manifests in that thing. For example, the truth that salt is salty exists only in salt and nowhere else. Or the truth that sugar is sweet exists only in sugar. And this same character, this is true also of every Dhamma, every teaching of the Buddha, that the truth of that exists not in the words, but only in the thing itself. And so we must taste it for ourselves to, to know that truth. So this is why the Buddha, when he talked about Dhamma, the first adjective that he used to discuss Dhamma was the word santitiko, santitiko, which means to see for oneself, to know one for oneself, to experience oneself. The Dhamma can only be seen and known and experienced in this way. And so we, we follow the Buddha, we practice according to the way the Buddha taught, because we believe in ourself, we have confidence within ourself. If you understand this, it will be very good for you. San titiko, sang means, or titi means to see. Sang means oneself, by oneself, for oneself, or it can mean within. <clears throat> so when we say the Dhamma is Santitiko, we mean that everything has its truth within itself. And we, to see Dhamma, to see the truth, must see the truth by ourselves for ourself, within ourself. There's no other way. If, if it's not Santitiko, it's not Dhamma. It's just more blind faith. It's only the truth if it's Santitiko, seen <coughs> by oneself, for oneself, within oneself. The next adjective the Buddha used was akaliko, which means not associated with time, not relying upon time, not having anything to do with time. And what this means is that all actions automatically, naturally have a reaction. The result of any action has nothing to do with time. We don't have to wait for the result. We don't, it doesn't, which means it doesn't depend on some God or external power or anything to create the result. That when there's an action, there will naturally be a result. And so this means that with Paticca Samupada, we we must act correctly according to this, and then the results will happen by themselves according to these, the natural way, the natural law of things. It isn't dependent on some God. This is called a galiko, beyond time or unconcerned, un, unconnected with time. These things aren't a matter of time, 
or anything such as God that creates time. He wants me to, a better translation, not relying, not depending on time. Not depending on time. For example, when you hit a drum, the sound arises immediately. It doesn't, the drum doesn't need anyone to come and help it make the sound. Hit the drum and there is the sound. It is not dependent on time. It's a gali go. The next adjective is ehi basi go. Ehi basi go, which means that the truth is right here. So that you can call anybody and say, come and look. You can see it right here. The truth isn't hidden anywhere. It's right there for everyone to come and see. And so that means if, if we hit the drum, we can, we can tell anybody to come and look. See, you hit the drum, it makes a sound. There's nothing mysterious or hidden about it. The truth is, is right there for everyone to come and see. This is ehi basi go. And so in the, in learning about Dhamma, in practicing Dhamma, in tasting the fruits of Dhamma practice, every step and stage of this process is ehi basi go. <clears throat> we can invite anyone to come and see that it is true. The next one is O Banayiko, O Banayiko, which means that, means two things. It means both that that Dhamma ought, we ought to have that Dhamma within us, and that we are able, it's, it's possible to have that Dhamma within us. Obana Yigo is both that we should have and that we can have all this Dhamma that we've been talking about. We can have it right here for our, in ourselves. And the last one is Pachadang We Titapo, which means no one can experience it for another. The Dhamma is you can't experience the Dhamma for your friend or your teacher can't experience the Dhamma for you. That no one can experience the truth for another. This is the last adjective the Buddha used to describe the Dhamma. Bacha Dang We Titapo. It's something that must be experienced personally. So please remember these, these adjectives about Dhamma. Then we can always tell whether what's being talked about is real Dhamma or just another bit of blind faith. There's Santiti Go, to see, to see by oneself, for oneself, in oneself. Akali Go not dependent on time. Ehi basi go. It, the, the truth exists so that everyone can be invited to come and see. O banayi go. It's something that we ought to have and can have in ourselves. And bacha dang we tita po. It can only no one can experience it for another. It can't be experienced for us by someone else. Let's see how this applies to your practice of mindfulness with breathing. In the first tetrad concerning the breathing, one practices until one can regulate the breathing until one has mastery over the breathing. Then the breathing can be calmed 
the body can become. This is something which is sanditiko. You see it for yourself. You see it in yourself by practicing it. It's a gali go. It doesn't depend on time. It, the results of this will be apparent immediately when, when this is done. It's ehi basi go. The truth of it is right here for anyone to come and see. Obana yi go. It's something that you ought to have and can have within you. And it's something that is experienced personally, for, not by someone for us. This is one example of how just the breathing, the calming of the breathing, how our body is at ease and how our mind is totally at ease. How this arises is, is santiti go, etc. So when you're hot, when the, you feel very hot physically, you can use the breathing. Use the breathing to cool oneself down. You, you don't, so you don't have to go and turn on a fan or anything. Or if you have a cut in your bleeding, if you establish mindfulness on the breathing and make the breathing more refined, more gentle, more calm, then the breath or the blood will, will escape more and more slowly. The blood will flow less and less. Or whenever you want to relax, you can just use the breathing to make it more calm, more refined in order to relax yourself. You don't have to go to the beach to relax. You can just use, sit right here and use the breathing. You don't have to go anywhere else. And this is much less expensive. Then for the second tetrad, we can have happiness, rapture, contentment, all of these pleasant feelings, we can have them whenever we want. We can summon them immediately by making the breath refined and calm as we are practicing. This One can have these whenever one needs them if one has practiced the second tetrad successfully. If we practice the third tetric successfully, then we will be masters over, over our minds. This means that we can use the mind however we need to, however we want. We can have the mind be in whatever state we wish. There will be total mastery over the mind so that it can be used in whatever way we need, if we practice the third tetrad successfully. And then if we complete the fourth tetrad, then we can have Nibbana any time in any place that we want it. Wherever we want, whenever we want, we can have the quenching of heat, the quenching of thirst, the quenching of dukkha at any time and any place once we have succeeded in the fourth tetrad. And the most important thing is that we have freedom from the defilements whenever and wherever. And then we can see that henceforth this life will never bite this life won't bite anymore. It will be a life of peace, a life of freedom, a life of happiness. So this is how success in Dhamma practice is, that it will be santiti go. You'll see it for yourself, by yourself, in yourself. Agali go, it doesn't 
depend on time. It's a hibasiko, you can call your friends over to see the truth of it. It's o banayiko, something that you should and will, can have inside. And it's bachetang we titapo. No one can experience it for you. So finally, you will be able to see for yourself that Buddhism is a science of, of nature. Buddhism isn't a philosophy. It's not a logical system or some speculative theoretical system, but it's a science of nature, a direct experience of the reality of nature. It's a scientific study and practice of and within nature. This is the true characteristic of Buddhism. If it isn't in this way, if it's not a science of nature, then it's not really Buddhism. It's just philosophy or something masquerading as Buddhism, or maybe just blind faith masquerading as Buddhism. And when we use the word science, we must add the word spiritual in front to make it clear. It's a spiritual science of nature. And so you can santitiko, you can see for yourself that Buddhism is appropriate for this, this nuclear age or, or this computer age. And so we can, we can build a world, we can create a world that is truly satisfying by applying these principles. And so finally, let us say once again that we are very happy that you came like tourists and you leave as pilgrims with a true God in your backpack. And so that's the end of the talk. We thank you for being very good listeners. <laughs>